messed it up already. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this prestige lecture by Prof. Borel van Gheel. I would just like to give a quick introduction to the professor and the proceedings here today. Um, and then after me, Prof. Dorel is going to give her presentation. After that, Prof. Estelle Taylor is going to give a reply to the lecture. And then finally, there will be an opportunity for some refreshments and some social afterwards. Now, the title of this lecture today is going to be How Does Research Impact Your Everyday Life? Which is work that has been going for the last 20 years in Prof. Dorel's uh, career. And we all look forward to hearing from her wisdom. Now, by way of a short introduction and biography of Prof. Dorel van Gheren, I'm going to read. There's quite, a, quite an extensive one. But Prof. Dorel van Gheren is a distinguished professor and multidisciplinary researcher leading the Center for Community Technologies at Nelson Mandela University that develops ICT solutions for Africa by Africans in Africa. She is effectively known as the people's professor for bringing smart technologies to the person on the street. Under her leadership, her group has developed more than 30 mobile applications and websites in the health, education, and agricultural sectors for use by marginalized communities. She and her team have won various awards for their research and application development within Africa. In addition, her group engages with scholars and low literacy communities and has presented e-skills training to more than 400 scholars and community members over the past five years. Prof. Van Gheren holds a PhD in computer science from the University of South Africa, and she has received numerous accolades for her work, including the Commonwealth Digital Health Merit Award and the UN African Innovation Forum Award. She has supervised more than 80 postgraduate students to completion and produced over 150 peer-reviewed journal articles and conference proceedings. In 2022, she received the Public Engagement with Research Award from the National Research Foundation, where she is also an NRF-rated researcher. Now, in addition to Prof. Van Gheren, we've also got a number of honored guests that are joining us today. Um, the first one, which I didn't actually know was on the list, is our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Prof. Linda uh, Duplessis, who's followed also by Prof. Ian Rothman, who is the director of the Obtentia Research Unit, where Prof. Daryl Van Gheren is an extraordinary professor. Prof. Myrna Nell, who is the Deputy, uh, Deputy Dean for Research and Innovation of the Faculty of Humanities. Prof. Tebe Madupe, who is also the Deputy Dean for the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Science. Uh, Prof. Estelle Taylor, who is the Director for the School of Computer Science and Information Systems. Dr. Imelda Smith, which is one of the program leaders for the Unit for Data Science and Computing. And then we also have program leaders from the Obtenso Research Unit. And then over Zoom, we have a number of collaborators and fellow academics that are joining us for this prestige lecture. A special welcome to all of you. Now, in this prestige lecture, uh, Prof. Dorel van Gheren is going to challenge us on our views of how we can use research to impact the communities around us. She will present research on the technology she has developed over the last number of years and how this can be used to influence Education 4.0 and how students can be prepared for the world of work and its continuous technological advances. Additionally, Prof. Van Gheren will present the ways in which she has managed to leverage this research to the benefit of local communities in a very tangible way and how work of this nature can, be turned, uh, can in turn be used to bring about research in the field in and of itself. I thank you very much for your attention, and I would like to hand over now to Prof. Tan Kriyanen to give her prestige lecture. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, um, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and honored guests, uh, Prof. Ian Rothman and uh, all the colleagues from Optentia, specifically also uh, Dr. Yapi Griff. Thank you for the kind words of introduction. And then also to those watching online, I know that a number of colleagues from Kabecha are also watching this lecture, so thank you for joining us online. I'm going to ask for a little bit of forgiveness this afternoon. You know, technology is a wonderful thing when it works. Coming from a technologist, that's quite rich. But um, there may be one or two hiccups here this afternoon. We had a few challenges before we started. So if you see that things become a little bit flustered, please just bear with us. We live in fluid times, so we will try our best to make it a smooth journey. 
So as Yapi indicated, it is my absolute pleasure to talk to you this afternoon about how does research impact on your everyday life. I've been in academia for a little bit over 20 odd years and have spent some time in industry as well. Um, and I have to say, Yapi and I were discussing earlier today, where do you work the hardest, in academia or industry? So the jury is still out on that. We, we agree to disagree. He thinks you work harder in academia. I think you work harder in industry. But I suppose it depends on what you are busy with at the given time. But over the past 20 plus years, I have had the privilege of doing research in many different communities. And my journey of research started way back when in 1984. So if I can go to the next slide, and um, I just want to share with you the journey that I will be taking you on. First and foremost, I'll speak to my background, and then just reminding us, I, I would hope that in this room we know what research is and why we should conduct it, but maybe there's some misconceptions about that. How does it impact our everyday lives? And then, of course, the fourth industrial revolution, which is the buzzword that everybody is using at the moment. How do we translate research so that the man in the street actually understands what it is that we are doing? And then I will conclude with some remarks at the end. So on the next slide, I start with the heading of 1984. Now, those of you who were perhaps at school in, in those years or just prior to that, we'll remember the book of George Orwell, 1984. Um, it was one of my prescribed books, I think, in, in those days, in Standard 6 or 7 or one of those. And I thought, you know, if I think back of, of the days in 1984, I was already at university, I have to say. But the society that was portrayed in 1984 is the society that we are living today in many ways. And that's actually a very scary thought when you think about it. Um, there was social control that was exercised through disinformation and surveillance. Now, when I talk about surveillance, um, my standard reply to people is they usually ask you, so if I've deleted it out of cyberspace, it is gone. Eh? If you don't want it out there, don't put it out there because it is never gone. And the computer scientists in the room will certainly agree to that. So that whole issue of control and surveillance is ever present in our daily lives. So who would have thought that what we read in George Orwell's book in 1984 will become our daily reality now? And, and that, that really sits with a little bit of discomfort with some people. So I say there, as a scholar of literature, I argue that the techniques and technologies described in the novel are very much present in today's world. So now you probably wonder, okay, this woman is saying she's a scholar of literature, but Yapi just said I have a PhD in computer science. So I'm one of those people who started university and couldn't quite decide what I wanted to do. So I studied just about anything and everything that I could, um, which in hindsight, has prepared me for many different things because I started in law and I went to humanities and then to education, did a bit of a stint overseas, came back, worked in township communities, um, did some teaching there, then entered into postgrad teaching and postgraduate um, studies. The university invited me to come and work part time for them. I decided oh, well, you know, I've always wanted to do this, and, and it sounds interesting, so let me do it and go and see. And now, um, 26 years later, I am still there. So, um, but anyway, be that as it may, I then started with computer science only, much later on in my life, and went through the motions of completing a PhD in computer science. So you can see from 1984 to 2023, nearly 40 years later, where are we now? But anyway, so if we go to the topic of today and we move to the next slide, um, I wonder if I were to ask you, and please you're not allowed to Google, how many of you know who Albert Sens is? Ever heard of him? He's the founder of vitamin C. 
the person who actually discovered vitamin C, which is something that we know we all use, and in the time of COVID, we used it even more. He said that research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought. Just pause there for a moment. To see what everybody else has seen, but to think about things that nobody else has thought about. And I'm so reminded of postgraduate students when they start their journey of research. And the first thing that, as supervisors, we often ask them is, why are you wanting to do this? And I can guarantee you that in my years, I have had very few people who've given me this answer as to why they are wanting to do a PhD or a master's. In fact, if I were to ask any of you whether this was the reason why you did a PhD or a master's, would any of you have answered that? More than likely, no. We all had different reasons, but ultimately, this should be one of the very essence of why we do research. So when we go to the next slide, I say, what is the purpose of research? So now you're probably thinking, really, I mean, we all know what the purpose of research is. Well, I'm not necessarily sure, because it depends on who you're asking. And you know, with these things, we see things as we are, not as they are. So the next slide helps us to clarify this a little bit. Research helps us to learn how to work independently. It also helps us to learn how to work scientifically. It helps us to have an in-depth knowledge of something. The in-depth knowledge of something, to me, is very, very important. It also, contrary to popular belief often, helps us to elevate our mental abilities by letting you think in a higher order thinking strategy, or then the HOTS, of inferring, evaluating, synthesizing, appreciating, applying, and creating. And just before coming across here, we had the discussion about the kind of people that we are when we do research. Um, some of us like to be very philosophical about research, Others like to be very pragmatic and just get their hands dirty and get on with it. Well, the combination of that results in very good outcomes. Of course, it also helps us to improve our reading and writing skills. That is now, of course, if you are not making use of chat GPT and things like that when you're writing, but hopefully you are writing your own text. And for those who do not know what chat GPT is, that is the latest bot that was released to write on behalf of scholars and whoever else wants writing done. But of course, as in the world of technology, there are already some counter products out on the market in no time. Finally, I say that to be familiar with the basic tools of research and the various techniques of gathering data <coughs> and of presenting research findings. And I think this is something that is really important. This morning we had the, the very auspicious occasion of the book launch led by um, some of the colleagues from Optentia. And I think what sort of struck me in listening to that was how all the data was collected to present the findings that we have there. And it was done over a, a lengthy period of time and using different techniques, et cetera, which means that the contribution of that piece of body of knowledge is so powerful because it was not just one person, not a one horse show exercise, but bringing skill sets together and a multitude of disciplines, et cetera. So that makes it a very, very powerful piece of knowledge that is being shared there. If we go to the next slide, one of the most critical parts, I think, personally, why we do research and why I do research is to free myself to a certain extent from domination of a strong influence of a single textbook, or for that matter, of the professor's lone viewpoint or spoon feeding. When I was still teaching 
in the classroom or in the lecture hall, I used to talk to the students and um, sometimes just throw in something very random and then ask them, do you believe what I just said? You know, after they'd made copious notes and so forth. And they'd say, well, yes. I said, well, why do you believe me? Well, Prof, because you said so. Um, and that takes me back to when I was a student doing literature studies in my German classes. I had a, a German lecturer who used to say to us, do not take everything that I say for granted and as gospel. You have to question. And that is the essence of why we do research, is to be inquisitive and to question, not just to take everything that a person with a PhD or something says as the truth and the reality and what it is. You know, when, when you work with different data sets, we always say, let's look at what the data tells us. So if the data does not tell you that, then you are differing from the other person. And that's fine to differ, because that is what research is about. So make sure that you do not give in to a strong influence, but rather let the data and the experience speak to you. Next slide, please. So coming to the question of the day, how does research affect your daily life? So I think in many ways, you know, we have so many different things that happen, and we don't even think about it as the culmination of research, that this is the outcome of, of research. Just before we came here, um, we were struggling to get the technology to talk to one another because we have different technology systems and so forth. And through our combined experiences, we managed to get technology to work. So imagine if we had not been exposed to things before, how would we have solved that problem? We probably would have had to call in someone from outside with the hope that they could come and solve it. Um, we had a short space of time, but combinedly we could manage that. The outcome of that is that I'm able to stand here and talk to you, but that does not just come automatically. That is a result, it's an outcome of research that has happened over a period of time. So research is not only an academic exercise. Research is what you are experiencing in your everyday life. So whether you have a PhD, whether you have a higher certificate, or you have no qualification whatsoever, you are still able to do research. Please let us not be under an illusion that you need to have all these qualifications. And academia, they're such snobs. They think that, you know, really you need to have all these qualifications. And, and I beg to differ. If we go to the next slide, I say that every day we benefit from the countless hours of research that have been conducted by scientists and scholars around the world. So what a privilege we have that nowadays at the click of a button, you can speak to anybody anywhere in the world. In days gone by, you had to travel for many, many hours to get there to speak to people. Nowadays, it's not an issue. And of course, where there were barriers before in terms of language and things like that, that's no longer an issue. From the moment that we wake up in the morning until the time we go to bed at night, we rely on research to improve our lives in a variety of ways. Many of the items that we use every day, our phones, our laptops, all of those are the results of years of research and development. I remember in the early 2000s, I had the opportunity to go to Finland and had a, a big cloak and dagger visit to Nokia to see the first smartphone being produced. Now, nowadays, Nokia doesn't even make a phone anymore. But in those days, we were not allowed to take cameras in, not allowed to take photographs. You had to get clearance to go into the Nokia factory and all of those things. And look at where the cell phone brought us, where we are now. Remember the first cell phones, they were about this size. You could use them for doorstops. Okay, then we went very small and now I see we're returning to those big bricks again. But the, the power of, of those phones is of such that we can change the world using those. So I say, and when we see a news story about a new medical breakthrough or a natural disaster, 
it is often the research that has resulted in this breakthrough that was conducted over time. We have just come through the COVID pandemic, and now I'm not going to have the debate about vaccines or no vaccines, but there was research involved in that, and a magnitude of research. So why were they able to put vaccines on the market so quickly? Because the SARS-2 virus has been researched for years. So in other words, they had to make a few tweaks to that to be able to get a vaccine out. So contrary to what people were saying about it was not tested and blah, 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 all those things, it actually was. It was just not tested as a COVID vaccine. It was tested as a SARS-2 vaccine. So years and years of research went into that. So in short, we can say that it truly affects our daily lives in many ways, big and small. Without it, we would be living in a very different world. And I would hate to think what that world could look like. Cast your mind back to 1984, to the, the book 1984, let me rather say that, not the year, but the book 1984, where they started out in the book and how they moved through to where they are at the end of the book. So on the next slide, I give some examples of the importance and use of research in our daily lives. So I'm saying that we use cars, bikes, bicycles to go from one place to another. These are all the results of scientific research. Do we ever think about it? We just get into the car, get onto the bicycle and go. We don't actually stop and think for a moment that there's some research that went into that to produce all of this. Something as elementary as soap that you wash yourself with. Soap didn't just happen. There was research that went into that. We use gas and stoves. Well, maybe I should just say we use gas at the moment in South Africa for cooking because we know that we have some challenges there. But that is also as a result of research that has taken place over many, many years. Just imagine for a moment if we did not do research on using gas in household conditions, where would we have been? Or solar for that matter, you know, with the electricity crisis that we have. This building is a product of research. I'm told this is a new building. So take this building and compare it to one of the older buildings on campus and see the difference in the buildings. And then you will see how the research has evolved to come up with an ergonomically pleasing building that provides a positive user experience. So that all comes from research. So even something as simple as an iron that you use to iron your clothes, that also didn't just materialize overnight. There was research that went into that. What is the right temperature? How do you add steam to this to get a better product? You get these irons that seamstresses use that they just hold with steam and they go up and down like this. That didn't just happen. A lot of research and design went into that to understand when it is the right thing and when not. So on the next slide, I say that when we observe the magic and importance of the outcomes of research, we can say that it has a vast use in all fields of human life. In fact, research has a great importance to make our lives easier. It gives an answer to all curiosities related to life. Well, maybe not all, but most in any event. But more importantly, it gives wings to our imagination by its facts and theories. The nicest thing about research is that you can dream. And you can dream as big as you want to. Because you have the opportunity to see whether your dream will actually materialize. How often do we as human beings have that opportunity to do that? So when we look at the next slide, one of the hot topics at the moment is that of climate change and the impact of climate change. Now, as I'm standing here, I can certainly experience the impact of climate change. Um, in terms of the ambient temperature, heat, etc. 
At the moment, uh, we know that there are large parts of our continent that are suffering severely as a result of climate change. So because we do research, we can identify the challenges of climate change, we can work out mitigation strategies, and then we can move on to adaptation to combat and mitigate those challenges. And I'm not going to go through that whole list, but I think what is very, very important for me is probably the three in the center, being community engagement, water conservation, and local food, or then food security. So Africa, as we know, is a water-scarce continent. South Africa is a water-scarce country. Where I come from, the Eastern Cape, we are approaching our ninth year of a severe drought. We have less than 5% water left in our dams. So we had to do research to understand how do we mitigate those factors? And how do we adapt our daily lives? Suddenly when you go to Trebecha now, or then Port Elizabeth, you will see that most households have water tanks because we've had to mitigate the risk. If I were to ask you how many of you have water tanks at your house, Maybe some people, but not the vast majority. Um, because you don't always have a shortage of water here, whereas the Eastern Cape is known for that. If we look at food security, out of water scarcity, we have a problem with food security. So we need research to understand how do we address that. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, OK, this woman is in technology. She's talking about all sorts of things, but she's not touched on technology yet. I make the statement that technology is the glue between the disciplines. And therefore, we need to do research and community engagement to understand how we use this glue to bring about change and how we use that to empower our communities to mitigate some of the risks that they are faced with, some of the risks that are up there on the slides. On the next slide, I cite the case of Turkey. So those of you who do not know, there was a massive earthquake in Turkey yesterday on the 6th of February at 12.24 p.m., one of a magnitude of 7.5 on the Richter scale. That is huge. The last time I checked, the, the uh, number of casualties were in excess of 4,500 people who've died. I was watching some of the footage to see how they are trying to find survivors. Now, that's a natural disaster. Without research, how would we know what path to follow to solve that natural disaster? Or the impact of the natural disaster, I should say, because we can't stop earthquakes. But when you go and read about Turkey, you'll see the geographical area is located almost entirely on fault lines. And therefore, unbeknown to us, they have thousands of earthquakes of various magnitudes every year. So every once in a while, there's one of a higher magnitude. But an earthquake is not an unusual thing in Turkey. However, through research, they have been able to determine the paths of and the curves of the earthquakes coming. So to an extent, they, they knew that this was on its way, but of course there's very little that you can do to just be completely out of the way of, of the earthquake. So interestingly enough, because of the research and the practical data collection that they've done, in 2021, the Turkish Disaster and Emergency Management Authority documented 23,000 earth tremors in Turkey, just in 2021. Now, I have to confess that that would scare the living daylights out of me. I don't think I would want to go and live in Turkey, because just the thought of, of this is, is quite powerful. But can you imagine the amount of research that has to go into this, into a country like Turkey, to understand how they need to mitigate the risks and save their people from earthquakes. And yes, we, we have the odd tremor here and there, but nothing to this magnitude, and certainly not 23,000 of them in one year. 
So very, very important, mitigating natural disasters. Research is a necessity for that. If we go to the next slide, let's bring it a little bit closer to home. Who recognizes these slides? This was KwaZulu-Natal last year. Now, my question is, have we done the research in the weather patterns, the impact of climate change? Have we collected the data to predict that these floods would have happened in KwaZulu-Natal? The answer is probably no. Um, could we have prevented this? Had we done the research, had we done the data collection, had we done the data science, the data mining, we could have probably predicted, maybe not the full extent of this, because with climate change, you know, there are things that happen, but to a large extent, this could have been at least managed better than what it has been. We still have waterborne diseases in KZN. We still have areas of KZN without electricity as a result of the floods from last year. That's a scary thought, that something like that could have been managed better had we done the research. If we go to the next slide, this is a, a well-known proverb. Necessity is the mother of invention. I'm sure you've all heard this. I like to also say that necessity is the mother of innovation, because in the space that we work in, innovation leads to inventions, and inventions lead to innovations. So there's always a primary driving force for most new inventions. People don't just come up with things because they're bored, maybe one or two, but there's usually a strong driving force behind that. So on the next slide, I talk a little bit about the fourth industrial revolution, and I invite you to watch the imagery at the back there. We have the new era of digitalization. Now, also for those who do not know, there is a difference between digitalization and digitization. Um, I'm not going to ask you what the difference is, but if you don't know, then go and look it up. We are in the era of the fourth industrial revolution where we are unleashing infinite new possibilities for industries, for governments, for cities that dream of building a more agile, digital, resilient, and sustainable future. I've just returned from East Africa where I spent time in Kenya and Uganda. Those of you who've been there before would know that traffic used to be an absolute horror story. To get from Entebbe Airport to the heart of Kampala could take you three and a half hours. With the agility that they've applied and the resilience of building new infrastructure, it now takes you 25 minutes to get from Entebbe to the heart of Kampala. So we live in a digital era where Everybody's talking about the fourth industrial revolution, the Internet of Things, Education 4.0. Imagine if you could do anything and everything that you have to do every day in real time, optimizing your time efficiently, your productivity, and your safety. You see, Yapi, this is where we get to the industry versus academia again. And then put it all into action at the click of a button. Now, in some areas, the click of the button is possible already. But in other areas, we still have a long way to go. So if we really apply our minds and we look at innovation and invention, we could operate far more effectively, meeting both our business and sustainability goals, whilst maintaining the continuity of our operations. So if you think back of the time of COVID when everything had to go online and digital and so forth, I think higher education institutions were maybe a little bit better prepared than the school or the secondary school environment, thanks to the fees must fall, because we had all of that happening. So we had to put some mitigation plans in place. So when COVID struck, suddenly 
you know, we could move a little bit faster. But with that has come the transformation of how we do things and where we are now. And therefore, we need to now consider the Internet of Things and the Fourth Industrial Revolution and digital technologies as we move forward. If you are not considering digital technologies, then I'm afraid you are going to be left behind. And as part of this morning's launch of, of the, the book, um, we spoke about the future going forward of, of the Yabelana app and the possibilities of how we can use that where we had a, a digital native uh, end user. That has changed. How many older people are now using tablets, phones to Skype their children living abroad? Um, they on social media. I have an elderly father who reads e-books, and that resulted out of COVID because he couldn't get to a library. So we need to have a mind shift as to how we go forward. On the next slide, I discovered this very recently, and I'm not sure how many of you have seen this, Health 4.0, where you now have a skin that you can put on your hand and it lets you touch things in virtual reality. So WeTAC is a thin, wearable glove-like device that provides tactile feedback to users in virtual reality and artificial reality environments. This innovation has great application potential in virtual games, in sports, in technical training, social interaction, or remote control robots. It comes from Korea. The users can experience virtual objects in different scenarios. So you can actually put this glove on your hand and grasp a tennis ball in virtual reality, and it will be as if you're holding the tennis ball in your hand. Imagine that. Imagine the world that it opens up for us. So the colleagues that are busy with this study, they say that it exhibits great flexibility and guarantees effective feedback in various poses and gestures. I don't know how many of you have seen the robots that can now do human faces and show emotions, etc. Imagine adding this to a human-like robot, which allows you to not only show facial expressions, but also have sensory feel and touch. I know in uh, countries like Cyprus and, and Greece, they are using robots um, without a mouth to teach children who are hearing impaired to lip read. Fascinating studies. Or they have the robots that go into the courts to um, escort children who are there for um, cases of uh, child violence, etc. So, you know, the, the opportunities in the health space in terms of the fourth industrial revolution are endless. So on the next slide, I go to the topic of bridging the gap. Bridging the gap between research and society. Some few years ago, a well-known actor in South Africa attended one of our award ceremonies at Mandela University. And he said to me, Prof, you guys do all this work. How do you tell it to the man in the street? The man is one of our alumni, Dr. John Carney. And uh, he got me thinking, because what do we do to tell the man in the street about what we've learned in our research? And at the time, that became something that I wanted to focus on, was bridging that gap. Bridging the gap between the researcher and the public, and taking the research into the public to make people realize that without research in your daily life, not much can happen. So on the next slide, obviously there's an approach that one uses. So I have the three anchor points. The one is the topic, what is it that I would want to communicate? Who's my audience that I'm communicating it to? And what mode will I use? How will I do that? There's not a one-size-fits-all. There's not a theory that says this is how you do it. 
this is something that you have to work out depending on the community that you are working in and the people that you are sharing the information with. On the next slide, I took that approach and enhanced it a little bit more to say, how do we enhance scientific literacy? Because if we want to share with the public, we also need to ensure that, like we look at digital literacy, that we also need to have scientific literacy in the public. So know your audience. Look at the demographics, the disposition knowledge. Ensure your topic is significant and relevant to your audience. There's no point in presenting something to them that they have no interest in. Why would they be interested? Include information about science and how you came to know the facts on your topic. People want to know how you knew that. They don't just want to know it's there. Think of young children. You will tell them something and then they'll say to you, why? So it is that why. Share with people the why if you want them to have scientific literacy. Know the effect you wish to have on your audience. Sometimes you just want to share information, other times you want them to participate, to co-create, to co-travel with you. Ensure that your communication platform is appropriate for your audience. Not all platforms are suited to all audiences, so make sure that you choose the right one. And then finally, last but not the least, most certainly, is use a language that is suitable to your audience. Because if they do not understand the language, then they're not going to be able to do anything with what you are telling them. So when we go to the next slide, I take us to a point where we have to now go beyond the journal article. And most people in this room are academics and would know that we are encouraged to publish in journals and things like that. But the question is, do we take the knowledge that we've learned beyond the journal article? If not, why not? If yes, how do we do that? And what do we take? So I spend my life doing exactly that, going beyond the journal article taking the knowledge from this machine, from the data that I've collected, and taking it into the community to share with them what we have learned, why we have learned that, and how it is relevant to them. So that means that there's public engagement with research. So the next slide, I look at exploring community-engaged research experiences and preferences. Why should you do that? Not because it's part of your KPA or anything like that. It is something that is essential. Community engagement becomes very, very relevant in, edu in educational institutions, but institutions of higher learning. If what we learn here is not communicated outside of this, how will it ever get there? It is our social responsibility, our moral responsibility, to do just that. So I say that community engagement may make research more relevant, translatable, and sustainable, hence improving the possibility of having more examples, for example, to reduce health disparities. We do a lot of work in, in the health space, so that's just but one example. And then, important, what are the strategies for community engagement to be adopted by research teams to identify areas for enhancing engagement in future community engaged research. I come from my home institution where community engagement is a thing at our institution. And I know here at Northwest it's also a thing. And there are not many educations of high, uh, institutions of higher learning where engagement is truly a thing, that people realize the responsibility of engagement and community engagement. And I think what is important for me about this is that as academia and academic institutions, we need to realize and acknowledge that we can also learn from our communities. 
does not mean that they only learn from us. We also learn from them. So the next slide looks at how do we approach research translation. Now, they're the three pillars, research and scholarship, teaching and learning, public and civic engagement. When we look at research and scholarship, I think this one we know quite well, that we have community engagement, community-based research, knowledge translation activities, scholarship of engagement, practice-based participatory research, public-funded research, all of those nice things. Teaching and learning, community-engaged learning. When Yapi introduced me, he spoke of our learning and skilling of people in communities. That's something that we pride ourselves in, that we have practice-based learning and experiential learning that happens. And some of these result in internships and co-op placements, etc. so that we, we do collaboration with our communities. I think the one that is largely neglected in many ways is that of public and civic engagement. So citizen science, do we really engage in citizen science in South Africa? And, and maybe this is a question that we need to ask ourselves and reflect on that. So there are lots of suggestions as to what those could be. But I think one of the most important things for me is to take policy advices and engage learning and taking that into community engagement to ultimately result in citizen science. If you have citizen science, then you have an educated citizen who actually understands why things are happening in a specific manner. And if you can back that with data collected in specific places, I suppose that's load shedding now happening, um, then we have true civic engagement. But I believe that is a pillar that we still lack in, in South Africa. So if we go to the next slide, I say, how easy is it for people to understand scientific language? Now, this is, this is very difficult. You can have people speak English without people speaking an understandable English. So my first point there, when it comes to the best practices of science communication, a lot of importance is attached to accessible language and digestible content. I'm going to show you some examples in a moment. For the lay audience, please do not use jargon. We have to keep it free of jargon. Scientific technical terms should be used sparingly when you communicate in a, to a non-scientific audience. And this may sound like, yes, we know that. But the question is, do we do that? And the answer is more than likely no. So. The, in our communication of using scientific language and, and layman's terms, there are gaps in perception. So be careful that you do not portray the scientific evidence through your own perceptions, but that it remains objective and independent so that you can still share with people what have come out of the research without making it your subjective perception. Words that form part of a scientist's daily vocabulary could be perceived as jargon by a non-scientific audience. And oh, we are all, we have those buzzwords that we use that we like to throw around. Um, so be careful when you translate the research into everyday conversational language that people would want to understand. Remember, be wary also of oversimplification. Your citizen is not a fool. The community member is not a fool. So please don't treat them as such. Just explain things without using jargon, and then the message will get across. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you an example from one of our projects that um, has been running for approximately 10 years. It is the Kazimantu project um, in collaboration with the University of Basel, 
the Swiss Tropical Disease Unit. And originally the project was funded by the Novartis Foundation. And it is a true interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary project between information technology, human movement sciences, dietetics, psychology, education. Ticks all the boxes for that. But we had to find a way to actually convey certain messages to people in the community. And this is how we did it. Is this school a bit messy today? I thought so too, Tan. That bin can't cope with all the kids' rubbish from break time. And it's all junk food wrapper. Hmm. Looks like they need one of my special tiny talks on healthy eating. Looks like they need a burst of Kazi energy too. Morning, Principal Pumla. Oh, hello, Tandy and Kazi. Is everything okay? You look worried. I am worried, Tan. Look at these kids and look at what they are eating. What can we do as a school to help our children lead healthier lives and have more energy for learning? You know, Principal Pumla, we have something that can help you. Oh, you need to tell me more. Kazi and I are part of a program called Kazi Bantu. Kazi is a Swahili word meaning active, and Bantu comes from the Kosa language in South Africa and means people. Hmm, active people. I like it already. Go on. Actually, before I do, would you mind opening the Kaziband website on your computer? Of course. Kaziband was developed by exercise and health researchers at universities and associated institutions in South Africa and Switzerland. They realized that many children were not able I told you, technology is going to be fluid today. So that was an example of translating actual science into an understandable language that children and teachers would understand. So you would have noticed that there are subtitles in French underneath. We also have different um, videos in, in other languages. So, but the aim of that was to be able to play it to children so that they actually understand what is happening. There's a whole series of videos that they use for that. So if we go to the next slide, um, something that is really important is whatever we put out there needs to be contextually relevant. So as you can see from the example that I've just showed now, the context, the context of that is of primary schools. So the characters are characters that appeal to the primary school learners, and in many ways also to the teachers, because this is what they use to tell stories to the children. If we go to the next slide, these are two very different ones. Um, we're currently busy with porn addiction and the danger of porn addiction. There's a huge problem in South Africa with pornography and people being addicted to that. So. We are targeting teachers and parents and using different ways of getting that message across because porn is, is in many ways a taboo subject that you don't speak about. And in specific cultures, it really is even more so. Also next to that is the mood recording, Find My Mojo, that's being used by teenagers to record their moods. This allows them to record their moods and share with people, let's say a caregiver, a parent, or then even a, a clinician if, if they need to. But you can see the different metaphors that are being used here to convey the findings of what we have done. If we go to the next slide, that takes me to some of my concluding remarks. Um, the la next slide, please. So I say, does a scientist's job 
end after the publications of scientific findings? My answer to that is no. We have a scientific social responsibility as researchers. At an ideological level, the purpose of research is to improve lives and have a positive effect on society. That is ultimately, if we go back right to the beginning, what we said why we do research. Unless the findings are implemented for the benefit of the general public, the very purpose of a study is then defeated. So then why do you do it? Research is funded by tax money in many instances. So um, maybe we should you know, give the public value for their tax money as well and share that we have a moral obligation to report back on some of the benefits of the research that they funded through the tax money. All those grants from science councils and places like that, that comes from tax money ultimately. So the responsibility of the researcher should not end with conducting the research ethically and publishing the findings in a journal or presenting them at a conference. The community should also learn from that. So we have our scholarly community and then we have our public community, our citizen community. How do we bring those two together so that they can actually share the information and learn from one another. In my mind, that is what a science communi communication is all about. Scientists have many different ways of communicating their science to the public. Um, don't underestimate the value of press releases, memos, lay articles about um, different findings, blogging, promoting the science on social media because what that does is it stimulates the interest of people and it leads them to go and read the actual articles. I'm busy with a number of projects on cancer research where we've developed apps on cancer and supporting cancer patients, etc. So cancer is probably one of the most researched diseases in the world. If I had to tell you how many times by just clicking on a small something which looked very simple elementary to understand jargon, has it taken me to go and read articles and medical journal articles and things like that? Now, if it was not for the simple blog or something where people share their experiences, I would never have read those articles. So don't underestimate the power of those things. We know that there's the desperation of publish or perish culture in academia that takes us away from the moral obligation to give back to society. But I think it really and truly is our responsibility to do just that, to take back to society. If we go to the final slide, I say there, are we a science literate society? Now you can ask yourself the question, is your community here science literate. I know the communities that I go to are not necessarily all science literate. And then I ask myself, whose fault is that? The communities or mine? Have I done my job, my moral obligation as a scientist? So I think what we need to do is to also prepare our target audience to receive scientific information so that they understand how it is relevant to their everyday lives. Yes, we need to explain it in simple language, but the communication will also be more effective if people understand why they need to know this. And that is the key. So for research to truly impact people's daily lives, a more pervasive understanding of science is required. And I think our science community, and I mean science community in the broadest sense of the word, should take conscious steps in making society more science literate. This responsibility, in fact, lies with policymakers who influence science curricula at schools, undergraduate and graduate levels. It's not only the responsibility of the scientists, it is literally the responsibility of every person that 
is involved in some decision-making process that will impact on the life of another person. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Prof. Tarel, um, I was asking you if I can just sit here, but I think uh, you indicated that I should get up and move forward. Um, I've got some notes here because my memory is terrible and I would not have remembered everything that I wanted to say to you if I don't make notes. So please just um, uh, excuse me if I look at the notes. Um, when I started preparing um, to reply to Prof. Tarel's um, prestige lecture today, um, I started, of course, by reading the abstract and reading her bio, and um, then I went a bit further and I went and I looked on Google Scholar to look at her publications and the awards and everything to sort of just prepare me to basically say something in summary. And then I just realized that to summarize her publications is not an easy job because there was such a wide variety of fields. And you also then um, mentioned that. Um, by referring to your interesting background, which we could um, really see in what you've written. And then uh, doing that research, I got another bio that was actually on um, somewhere when you gave a keynote presentation to an international conference where they mentioned specifically the multidisciplinary background combining computer science, information systems, African languages, education, media studies, psychology. And then I realized why I thought it very difficult to even try to summarize um, the wide variety of publications, etc. cetera. Um, so for me, it's always been very, very important to try to motivate staff to realize the links that there should be between our different responsibilities. Um, we all know that academia, we are really, um, we've got a huge load since we have to do the teaching and learning, we have to do the research, we have to do community service, and I've always encouraged people to try to connect that wherever possible. And since I do my research mostly in education, it was very easy for me to link the teaching and learning with the research. But I've realized today, and what you've really weighed on my mind is, the responsibility to look even further and also link that with the community service, which I think um, we haven't enough, done enough of and I haven't stressed enough of even when telling staff you should try to, to link all of these, um, not only because it lessens the load, but also because it improves the relevance. And that's what I could really get from what you've said as well, um, that importance to just link that. And a few notes to just um, what I started thinking about when you started the talk, especially the concept of research impact, which I think is also something that was, was really, um, we have to think about and take from this. And um, I read somewhere once, that they said research impact is real change in the real world. And um, that is exactly, I think, what I also got from this that we really need to concentrate on. But that it takes researchers some um, effort to jump to that, that we need to develop new skills to be able to demonstrate that ability to create impact. And um, you mentioned social responsibility more than once, which actually really impacted me to realize that we have to also think more about that, about how to really also address our own social responsibility, even when doing research. So when you started with the whole the slide on, you know, breaching the gap and um, thinking about what we do with our research to take it to the community, I immediately thought, but Yes, we just published journal articles. And then you came to the next slide where you said exactly that. Um, we have to go beyond that. Uh, where we normally think as soon as we publish the journal article, we've now done what um, we need to do because we have a social responsibility to definitely do that as well. So it's not only academic activity, as you said. Um, and um, I'm also much more aware of how we have to open our eyes to the problems outside and what we can do to maybe specifically help address that. Um, something else that you specifically said there, you talked about a primary driving force and then the quote that you um, used of seeing things everyone sees and thinking about it in new ways. That really made me thought that's how I would like to go out here now and look about at everything in our community but also identify problems that maybe everyone see, but we can maybe look, um, you know, we have new thoughts about that, do research, come up with new solutions, and then have our research really impacting 
um, the community as well. So I think for me, yeah, there's a lot that um, definitely I think we can move forward and think about and that we can improve also in the way that we do research. So um, thank you very much for sharing this with us. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Darrell, for a bit, very thought-provoking lecture. Last week, I was listening to a presentation by a vice chancellor, Professor Mutua, on the engaged university. When you said it is a thing, I think we also don't have a choice. Um, if we want to be relevant as institutions of higher in learning, we have to take science to the community. And what we see increasingly happen with the unemployment and the seek for digital competence, we have that responsibility. But um, thank you for this in, uh, session. I think uh, Prof. Ian and his team um, have uh, some refreshments at the Obtentia House where we can further the discussion. But from my side, here's a certificate to say thank you thank and you. all of the best. Thank you very much.